Is this supposed to start the video? Oh, we'll just do a test to start video and see what happens. No, I did. And the host, it's streaming live. Hey, guys. Yeah, you're live. You're live. We're live. All right, everybody, thank you for tuning in for another evening with the Coach's Corner. We have lovely guests I will not introduce. I will save uh, the exciting news. Well, you'll see them for yourself um, for Duke Ronos to pass over. But I would like to say just as you're coming in, feel free, get settled, ask lots of questions. I'll keep an eye out on the chat. Uh, and I'll pass that off to everybody. Hopefully we'll get a chance to get to them. And if not, head over to the Coach's Corner because they're fabulous there and they'll be sure to answer anything that they couldn't get to tonight. So with that being said, I will pass this off to Duke Branos. Welcome everybody back. Um, looking forward to a great episode. Uh, I've, uh, the good part is that tonight we have uh, Duke Paul. Um, it's uh, I've got a chance to really get to know Duke Paul back when we did uh, the first Known World Rattan Symposium, which was uh, quite a number of years ago. And the Sean was there and we all kind of just hung out and uh, it was absolute great time, some great training. Um, and then over all the years, uh, Paul and I were both in uh, Australia at the same time. And so we got a, a lot of chances to be together at a lot of different training opportunities. And uh, so I'm really looking forward to getting some time with him again, uh, given that it's been a year and year and some. And uh, and I know that he's been, uh, you know, not only do we have a, a recent book right before COVID, but I think he's doing some other stuff. And we're going to talk about that a little bit today and uh, get some background and talk some fight stuff. So uh, um, we have uh, along with uh, with Paul, our special guest, we have. Uh, his uh, Royal Highness Sean, uh, we have Viscountess Beth, and uh, we have uh, Thorfinn sooner or later. He looked like he dropped off again. So uh, we uh, we got a great crew of folks and uh, looking forward to a great discussion. And uh, thanks for coming out. So Paul, uh, yes. I, I just, uh, thanks for coming. And I think we're gonna have another episode that me and you are gonna sit down and we're gonna talk about uh, what we'd like to cover you kind of we chatted uh, probably a month back uh, about some stuff and uh, i'm looking forward to uh, maybe covering that in the next episode uh, i'll get with you after these but uh, i think the first thing we'll do is uh, we, we got some standard questions and i we asked those just because i think people get interested in knowing uh give us let us know when did, when did you start in in the sca and what brought you um okay i was uh... My first event was October Crown in the West in 1970. Ooh. And uh, I've been a martial artist for an awful long time. And, you know, I, some my, one of my classmates in college says, hey, there's this new thing here. You might really like it. And I looked at it and I said, oh, God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I was, I was, that was my last semester in the um, and my undergraduate, and I got, went in the army three months later after I graduated. And so until I come back, then I looked him up and got in. Yeah, it's interesting because I came out of uh, the martial arts, the same same kind of thing. Uh, of course, you know, mine wasn't fifty years ago here, uh, but uh, um, in uh, in the late eighties, I uh, I was doing martial arts and and a bunch of different types. And I was the, the one I was in at the time was kendo. And I was like, oh, this would be great. I'm going to come out and, and really, you know, kill it. And uh, that uh, it was more like I came out and really got killed. Uh, so <laughs> how did you, you know, did you find when did you're, I mean, and I see this with a lot of people where they just kind of forget the martial arts they learned a little bit, and then it all comes about the stick, right? Uh, yeah. Did you have that same issue or? No, I didn't actually. Um, I was a, a pretty experienced judo player when I came in and I realized that uh, 
all the all the body movements and the force applications to move the sword around were the same thing I used to do judo throws. And so I built on that and I used basically the, the philosophy of judo, you know, best result with the littlest effort. Yeah, I think, you know, some of that is, you know, it's, it's funny because I'll go and even judo people are MMA guys and I'll, uh, and I'll be teaching them and showing them some stuff. And then I'll just I'll, I'll like, this is what you do here in, you know, in, in your judo stuff, you know, like, especially when you're talking about like that, that control and range control and, and that attachment to your opponent, you know, it's not even talking sword yet. Right. And, and then all of a sudden they get that, that click. I'm like, you know, they're like, Oh, you know, and it's, and sometimes and it took me a little while too, you know, I, I think I was trying to apply kendo concepts, which I really wasn't, you know, I was a couple of years in, I wasn't very uh, necessarily a top martial artist in, in kendo or anything, but I was trying to apply those. And I don't think I had a good enough understanding of the kendo stuff to understand, you know, most of that was straight line. Most of it was all burst. And that's what I applied. And then later it was like, it started just all my old, my other martial arts experience that connection with your opponent all that kind of stuff started rolling in so i actually I actually have one uh, technique that you go you pass through a position of a throw so if i if i was throwing some somebody with shoulder throw and it comes like this and then i do what i call a single hip onside to offside you pass through that same point right yeah, I think I've seen that. Uh, I've, I've seen uh, you teach that a number of times. So, hey, Bess, I got a question for you. Did you come out of martial arts? Uh, no, I came out of geekdom. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I went to a con in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin after playing D&D. &D, and I saw these guys fighting and I'm like, why would I want to say, oh, look at me. I'm rolling, you know, to see if I can walk in my armor when I can actually walk in armor. And that's, that's what got me into it. So no. Okay. <laughs> John, did, did, did oh, what did no. you come up? No, I, I did. I mean, I was, I didn't have any martial arts background when I started. Um, I was, I really didn't have a lot of athletic background to begin with. Most of the sports I'd done were just street ball stuff uh, with the neighborhood kids. Uh, I hadn't mm -hmm. done any, any kind of organized uh, sports prior to that. And so you know, I was able to learn SCA combat from the ground up, um, you know, and I was, I was fortunate enough that um, at the time that, that, you know, Brian brought stick mechanics to our area where the, it really had not existed prior to what he started teaching me. Um, I, you know, I was young enough that I really didn't, you know, I, I didn't have any bad habits to fix. Um, and I didn't know, you know, that I should be intimidated or scared or or whatever and you know brian said this is how you throw and so we just did it like that um so i mean all my all my fighting background all my martial arts background is is strictly from the ground up uh from sca combat um started doing pell work when i was 12 13 years old and like i didn't have any any martial arts prior and very little you know sport background yeah no, I totally get Thorfinn. Do you, do you martial arts before I, before coming in? Yeah, I'm a little bit of a story combination of martial arts and best. Um, I was like a D&D nerd, but also doing jujitsu a lot. And so the guys at the hobby store did did SCA, and I did jujitsu with their little brother. And so they kind of got us both into it at the same time. Uh, he, he went on to get knighted as well. So as a matter of fact, he, he came into the SCA as well. So. Yeah, so I would say I did jujitsu for about seven years, seven or eight years, and then uh, kind of phased out as I started doing more SCA. And really, what it was was honestly, there were girls in the SCA, and there were no girls. In the <laughs> and so I, I, just, I just switched over because I was like, "Man, this is way cooler." <laughs> so, uh, that's it. So, uh, so Paul, I guess uh, uh, we got a little bit of a, a mix. I, you know, I think we, and it is. Uh, we hear all those same stories a lot. So I, I, it's very cool. You know, I think one of the, you know, going back to uh, the known world rattan symposium, I think, you know, that one was a, a real huge one because I had been teaching, you know, uh, mid round, which encompassed all of uh, North shield and, and uh, Eldemir at the time, plus some down in Meridies and, 
and through those areas. But it was nice to actually get all the teachers together because I had never chance to meet, you know, obviously you were been teaching for a long time prior to the known world rattan symposium uh and then sean was teaching and you know all all of us came together i, I thought you know that uh, that first known world rattan symposium was just uh truly awesome i it was it was a nice way to actually meet all of the other well all there wasn't a ton of us but a lot of the a couple of the other big trainers around the world there yeah, it was really, really cool. I enjoyed it. So, Sean, did uh, as far as, uh, I mean, give me some, have you had a chance to sit through some Paul stuff? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, we had Paul out for, uh, for one of our collegiums uh, a number of years ago and uh, had a good, good chance to, to sit and talk with him. But, you know, we, we talked. Uh, you know, I, it was fascinating listening in on your uh, keynote speech at the no, the the Rattan Symposium. There, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff. That, a lot of the history of it that I hadn't uh, hadn't really picked up on before. Um, but I wanted to ask you something we hadn't really had a chance to talk about before. So, uh, as far as I understand, you were one of the first people to apply martial arts principles to SCA combat. Um, you know, so we're four years into the society at that point. Um, and prior to that, it was just kind of, you know, I mean, backyard barbecue, uh, hitting people stuff. Uh, so what was fighting like when, you, when you, you got here, um, compared to, you know, how you were able to, uh, apply some of those martial arts principles? It was pretty much the, uh, the D and D like crowd and then some historical buffs, uh, like Henrik and Sieg, Duke Henrik and Duke Siegfried and a couple others actually were making armor and stuff like this. So you had some people who were effective. The techniques were, let's say, suboptimal. Yeah. <laughs> and you had a lot of people where there were just no, that's why the snap was so, so revolutionary because pretty much it was, it was literally like this. It was all armor. And so when I saw when I when I brought brought this in, then it uh, it took off. The speed of fighting went up, uh, like doubled or tripled, and the power went up about the same, and the armor went up about the same. So so obviously that that's a evolution a little bit. I mean, some of that um, you know we all kind of uh, kind of grow. Through, through the ages of stuff, you know, and I can kind of, there's a number of different things I've changed and still are changing. And uh, um, do you think, so when did the snap, that snap come in? Was that pretty fast for you? That was right off, almost right off, right the, off the bat. Yeah, because, you know, I was also playing karate and I did just that, that whipping thing instead of using your arm to throw things. Yeah, but it was sort of a it was big, big sideways move, you know, come here, come way around like this. But it was still, you know, really fast and really hard, especially because I was using all my strength, not knowing better yet. It was sort of funny. One of those early practices, I actually didn't start fighting until November, right after the, 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 the tourney I attended. I didn't fight there. And I was fighting in a melee and I was trying out different kinds of shields. And I had this one, it was a 36 inch strapped round, which I do not recommend. <laughs> and I was fighting with a short ax and one of the older knights took my arm you know, and I said, oh, you could hit arms. <laughs> and the next practice, after about 45 minutes, nobody could move their right arms. And the head of my household came over and says, look, look, Paul, we got to talk. <laughs> So, you know, on that point, then, you know, so did, I don't know how that, you know, obviously it's the really early days of the SCA. Did you have somebody at practice that kind of took you under the wing at the very beginning? Um, Count Stephen De Lorraine uh, invited me into his household. Nobody knew, nobody knew how to really fight. So nobody really offered to teach me anything. I just came up with it, what I was doing. Best, you got a question? Yeah, I do. Actually, I have two questions for you. The first part is a viewer question. 
Would you describe how your fighting uh, has changed as you've aged, as we all have? But the other question, I, this is my hack, is if you could change your fighting in any way other than I wish I'd started when say I was 12, how would you, what would you like to see different about your own fighting style? Well, um, when I said, you know, the, the greatest effect for the least effort, what I do is, because I'm still growing my, my, my system, um, that I'm looking for optimums. How can I make the body move the best possible way so it takes advantage of the biomechanics and stuff like this? How can I move the sword so it takes advantage of principles of physics to produce faster, harder blows? And I keep working on that. And it's, uh, things have changed. Uh, I, I came up, I don't know, it was probably seven, eight years ago, maybe eight, nine years ago. I can't remember. I came up, with, came up with a concept I call commitment swings. Um, and what it is, is you swing a full speed blow at somebody that looks like it's going to land, but you have changed the angle just slightly. So it's coming in for a snap, but it's going to miss the top of your head by about that much. And they, this causes your opponent to commit to that block. And you're still going to the next blow. So come in, they commit to this, doesn't touch, and I come back around again. And that's led to a whole bunch, it's like, talk about opening a can of serpents, B. And, but I do the same thing, you know, I, I, I was the one that came up with the, the hip movement to, to throw your blade, still works, still works, but I'm really focusing on using the core muscles to translate my weight to another place, usually about an inch or half an inch. And then that moves the sore around. When you say move your, your core muscles, are you talking about maybe just like shifting internal, not internally, no, I am off to the, the side or something or? Yeah, the, 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 the uh, so these are my, my hips and I'll use the core muscles to move them this way like that or move them that way, front and back, whatever. And I use the, use the dropping of the weight. So as I swing, my weight drops towards my left knee, my, my shield knee. And again, it, it only moves about a, a half an inch or an inch, but that's all it needs. That answer a question? Yeah, thank you. Yes, yeah, so I come up with these things and then I just, I just play with them. I come up with different combinations and different ways I can make things move. Um, probably just before I came up here, I was, I was teaching a, uh, a class in my backyard it was on our technique stuff. And I had developed a blow that from the return of a snap and came back here and came around down here and came back up again. And it was probably the fastest thing I've ever seen. And, uh, this, this is fun, you know, so I'm playing with it. So I said, I wonder how close I can be to the Pell and still get the sword through. So I was about maybe 14 inches and I got it through and it came up and hit and bounced right back in my face. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. <laughs> Go ahead, Dorfman. You're on mute. Every time. Having the opportunity to, uh, to grow up in the West where you started. Um, so, you know, I, I learned a lot from people that you taught and kind of, you know, back of giants and all that stuff like that. Um, as we moved forward, so as you've changed your age, we were just, I think we were starting to hit on it. Did you notice that there was a way that you uh, compensated for that kind of uh, change in your, in your body? Have you had to adjust your style to address that? Is that one of the things uh, I was thinking that maybe we were hitting on uh, and then it kind of drifted away from that? Well, yeah, I do. You know, I, I, I use a system that's the best I know at the time. And then I notice something is happening, like the, the weight shift. And then I, then I start studying, what is it doing? How am I doing it? What effect does it have? And then I introduce it into my, into my system. Um, I don't really 
I stopped teaching the the hip movement at all. And except for if it's a smaller person, you need everything you can get. So you do the hip and the weight shift. I see. Okay, that is interesting. You know, that is interesting that you say that because uh, like talking about the hip motion and like applying that to to uh, power generation is so uh, I guess so ingrained now that you're you're not even having to teach it anymore. That is a uh, it's it's just assumed that they've learned that. That's what that's to me really fascinating. Well, some people I know, I know almost every fighting kingdom style uses uh, some variant of that hip motion. You know, something that interesting. Is, that is interesting. I'm sorry. Yep. Go. <laughs> it's sort of interesting. I was um, back in Maine uh, a couple of years ago, and I was teaching um, Mistress Maya, uh, who runs her own boutique publishing company, had said she wanted to publish my book. And I came up there and taught for a weekend and a couple more practices. At one of the practices, we had two physical therapists, and we were I was talking about this concept to them. So I had them stand on either side of me and put one hand on my back, one hand on my front. So I got one guy on one side, one guy on the other. And I just started swinging a sword around my head. And I said, What's, what are my muscles doing? And they said, it ripples around your body like this. Just this one fires, this one fires, this one fires, you know, like that. I don't know what that leads to anybody too, but it's an interesting phenomenon. So I'm curious, what do you do then in order to uh, develop your muscles? Like, like we, earlier before we came live, you were talking about a gym routine. So what do you do then to maintain your shape? Well, this is sort of odd because I, you know, until about my sixth or eighth year in the society, I kept myself in shape by doing what I, want, what I was doing, play judo, karate, sword fighting. And then it started to get where I needed a little bit more, but I didn't really do it much. So I slowly got out of shape, slowly started weighing more. And and after uh, longer than that, afterwards, uh, quite a while after that, I stopped, uh, I stopped practicing. Um, you, you stopped uh, practicing? Anything. <laughs> it wasn't fun anymore. That's why I stopped fighting. I stopped fighting because... It, the teaching was more fun, much more rewarding. And I didn't have to be in as good a shape for it. <laughs> so what, right now, what I'm doing is I, I do use the machines for aerobics. I do most of my upper body work with um, resistance tubing. And then I use body weight exercises mainly for the lower. And then I, I'll toss in a couple of machines like you know, uh, quad raises and hamstring curls that I can't do with the with the, the tubing and stuff. Well, I, I can tell you while you know while I still enjoy fighting, um, I, I can tell you that I that uh, since you know becoming more of a trainer, um, I you know I agree with you, Paul. That there's the, the the joy and the satisfaction that I get out of helping others achieve the kind of success that I've had is far more satisfying than than any success I can I can have for myself at this point. Um, you know, watch watching people take what you've given them and, and watching them become successful um, is is a level of satisfaction that I had never anticipated. Um, and it's like it's it's the best job in the world. It, I really enjoy it, especially when I've been teaching some odd technique to somebody and I see them use it in a fight. That's really exciting for me. I just love that. Yeah, I think I think that's the big piece. You know, I think that's one of the the most rewarding pieces is seeing the excitement in somebody's eyes after they can do something or they learn something. And you know, I that that whole teacher moment is uh, amazing. And getting to that place where you can help somebody succeed in what they are trying to do is uh, truly a gift. So, I remember this one uh, night from North Shield. He he had a squire working with me at Pensick, and then he started coming so he would know what I was teaching. So he'd help her. And uh, after a couple of years, we had a messenger correspondence we do every once in a while. He works swing shifts a lot. And then he sends me one. He says, I just one shot at somebody in crown <laughs> using my techniques. And that was a real big moment for me. 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's, I, I love those. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, even better when they uh, when when somebody hits you with you know. And there's a few oh. things I love more than getting hit with my own stuff. Yeah, you know, yeah. You, you get hit with it, and you get that guy that says, uh, "Was like, hey, I learned that from you." Oh yeah, I, I know where you got it from. The other thing I I, I seen that really changed in my style wasn't so much a change um, because I've always been very aggressive, so I always come after people. And later on, I'd, I'd rather them come after me, but they got more smart about that. Um, so the styles are becoming more static where you'll get two guys with a, with a closed guard and they'll, they'll creep into just about range and then they'll try to deke and duke some, each other. And um, I use a technique where I'm, I'm way the hell out of range and I throw a blow. And then as the weight shifts to that front foot, I let it slide forward. So I can move in anywhere between 14, 20 some inches. Uh, and that's what makes that those commitment swings work. Cause I'm coming in, you see the damn thing. You think, Oh, that's out of range. And then it comes a lot closer than you think. And you say, Oh God. And then you really commit to that block. And that gives me more advantage for the next blow. Darvin, so, you had hey, a, yeah. Hey, Paul, I got it. So there was a period of time when uh, in the West where you were winning every other crown. So it, it was uh, you and then it would do James Greyhound and then you yeah. and James Greyhound, you and James Greyhound like that. And I'm just wondering when you were doing that, you were obviously practicing a lot, but what kind of mindset, what were you doing uh, to prep for these crowns, you know, mentally what, or, or what was your kind of procedure for that? Well, that's, that's, sort of an odd, kind of... that's sort of an odd thing because um, I didn't. Um, Judo helped me get in a place where I can turn a switch and I'm there. And, you know, not talking to people and being very closed and stuff, right? None of that matters because there's that switch that I turn. Um, oh, interesting. That's sort of not really fair because I had, to, I had to get all the nerves and stuff out when I was playing Judo. Yeah. And so, I did. So that, that is interesting. So did you have... Like, uh, I, I do something similar too. Like I have a, a kind of a, you know, a thing that I do that brings me into the moment, right? Um, what was your, what was that? I mean, did you use like a mental thing? Was there like a physical trait that you did on, on the field? What was your thing to center you at that moment? Well, literally, like I said, it turned into just turning a mental switch. But in judo, you would come out and you'd bow to your opponent and then you'd make your, go like this to make your sleeves not tight right. on your arms. And, right. and that and I realized that's that's a, a, a physical mantra yep. that is signaling you're going to fight now. And right. so to teach it, because I've had a lot of people over the years say, how do you do this? How do you do this? And so I teach them to use their salute as a physical mantra. Right. So mine is I, I, I salute like this and I center as it goes down. And then as I. Get, I get my arms where they're supposed to be. I reach out my shield and figuratively grab my opponent. The sword grabs me and I bring us together into one thing. And at that same time, I come up on my on balls of my feet so I don't plant. Right. And, and it works really well. If you get somebody that's having that trouble, you make them do it every time they do the pell work, every time they do a fight in, in practice. So when they get in a tournament, it brings that less intense stuff from practice calms you down yeah that's cool great thank you that's a great answer i think thank you actually that really ties in well with a discussion last week when we were talking about rituals um and what do you do to prepare prepare for a tournament and getting into rituals and doing the same thing uh so i can see how that would tie into something we were talking about last week one question I have for you is that you were talking about training and that you really enjoy the teaching. So with regards to squires, do you have any special training, teaching, reading, anything that you'd like to do with your squires in particular? No, I mainly just treat them like I, like I do when I was in judo, like I got treated mainly. They taught you how to, how to do it. And um, they coached you through the tournaments, coached you when, you know, when you're having harder practice fights you know i sometimes bring everybody in my class in and we would analyze it one by one everybody there who was in the tournament and i would you know say and you did this and this and, this, and so on and so forth 
when I got up here for a while there, I was, I was, there's this one big tournament every year. I was actually taking notes on all my students. And then we go over them afterwards. <laughs> That's not intimidating at all. So would you recommend martial arts then? So here we are, like here I am, I've been in the SA for some number of years. We'll just leave the number of decades to one side. Would you recommend anybody start a martial art like a judo or a karate or something to help them with the SCA? Yeah, I think judo is the best because then you get the body mechanics for actually throwing the swords and shields around and you develop a pretty acute sense of where what your opponent is up to. Uh, like when we sparred in, in practice in judo, you're holding on to the robe and stuff. And we do that with your eyes closed. So all you had was whatever is going on that you can feel with your fingers. And after a while, you didn't need even that. You got so you knew what the other person was doing. And that became the basis of, of the perception techniques that I teach now. So that kind of ties in with a conversation that Coach's Corner has been having sort of offline that will come to online. Uh, we talk about, well, particularly Bronis talks about being a thinking fighter, always watching, always analyzing, always trying to determine what their opponent is doing. But it sounds to me as if just now you were saying that you're more of an instinctive fighter, that you've felt their bodies, that doesn't sound good, that you, um, you would re react to them almost instinctively. How would you describe yourself uh, or your style of fighting then? Okay, the, the fight becomes a, a flow of things. You and your opponent are moving in some way. And it, it is literally like waltzing, you know, not the same movements, but dancers can feel what their partner is doing and know that where they want to go and stuff like that. And that's why I teach this rhythmic slow work that I teach because your, your, your conscious mind apprehends the world you know that's what where you get your information but it's way the hell too slow to use it in fights but it teaches the subconscious and then the subconscious as it learns the patterns and the flows then it does the work for you so the only time i'll ever, ever actually think during a fight is when i'm out of range and sometimes a thought comes across you know like i'll be doing something and i'll say oh his arm's coming out i can do this you know, but I don't really think about that. It's, 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 it's pattern recognition, but the pattern is, is constantly changing. And you're looking for the, how the pattern is changing. And if something doesn't change, doesn't work right in that pattern, that draws your attention to it. Let's, uh, like this one, one uh, night I used to, I taught and then fought him. He, 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 was, a, he was an account. And we'd fight, and there's a little pauses in the fights where we're we're both on guard and just barely in range. And I just sit, I just stand there. And I could read him so well that when he made the decision to, to swing at me, that's when I would kill him. Not after he moved, but before he moved. And I don't have a clue how that works. Just the, 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 only, the only thing I can suggest is is the, the real top end of that pattern recognition stuff. In your description, you were saying that you did rhythmic slow work. I, I'm not sure if I got the term right. Could you elaborate on that? It sounds intriguing. Okay, this is a, this is a really one of the real important things in my teaching style. Uh, rhythmic slow work, you have to do it about quarter speed until you learn how to do it. Um, there are some rules for safety, like for instance, you never extend your wrist. You always, you always swing so you're here and the sword doesn't even get there, it's still sticking out of your hand. Uh, you have to keep it rhythmic, so the blows have to land on time every time. Because if somebody goes, that's something that surprises the subconscious and then it kicks it back to the conscious mind right then. So you, while you're learning how to do that stuff, you can't do that. Everything has to be completely smooth. And the same thing with speed. If you, all of a sudden you speed up, the conscious, the, the conscious mind takes over again and it's afraid, so it's not gonna do anything for you. And I, I, I 
do this in various different ways that sort of emphasize different things, but then I slowly go faster. Um, one of the ones I really like at the sort of the top end of the stuff, I call it fast and light. So you're swinging, but you're only, you're not doing a lot of effort. You're mainly using the, just the physics of that coming around. And so you're not hitting, but you're, what you're trying to do is you're trying to work on the flow to make it, make it like you're dancing a waltz or something like this. Does that answer? I have yeah, a hell of a time. I have a hell of a time getting people in other places to actually do that. You know, they always want to do the stop motion stuff, and they always, everybody wants to go too fast. I just sit around and when I'm teaching, and just you know, slow down, slow down, slow down, because it gets up pretty fast. Yeah, part of, part of that conversation we were having that the best was talking about is the uh, the conscious versus the unconscious uh, fighting types. And, um, you know, I, I think I tend to do it more by feel like what you're talking about, whereas Bronos and Ronvalder do it very consciously. And, and it's like, like they they do. They, they, they go through the fight by sight, whereas I go through it by feel. Is that is that an accurate description, Bronos? Well, there's still feel within that. So what we do a lot of there's there's pieces of thought. Most of it, same thing. What Paul's saying is it's happening. Some of that thought is happening in the safe times in the fight, or or in the safe times when you're dissing at the edge of range and are safe. Yeah. The the idea is in those times when when something you know you're we develop and we essentially look at all the moves on the board. We can see the breaks if if we speed something up we can see the weakness in our opponent in that change in them and then we can op take that opportunity to build that into the fight maybe two or three moves down um, yeah. same yeah. with any response to a blow that you know essentially hits or doesn't hit we analyze what happens in each piece of those so that that later i threw this they picked that up but they left this right and, and then, you know, when you go to execution, execution should be without thought in, in flow, in, you know, because otherwise, if you're thinking through the, every piece of your execution, like Paul said, it's very slow. You can't think through that every piece of your execution. But just like, it, you know, the, the idea of chess is we're lining up all the opportunities and then pressing on each one of those opportunities to create the next opportunity until we find the opportunity that will absolutely be safe to us and detrimental to them. You know, I did somewhat the same thing. It's just a, sort of an emphasis difference. Um, I think I think consciously too at the safe points in the fight. But what I really want to do is I want to get the flow moving. So like I'll, I'll slide into to not quite range, but just so I can hit the shield just to start things moving. And then the other person swings back and here we go. And I can read everything so well that way. Um, I'd rather somebody swing at me, like I said, because then I can do nasty things. But it got so I had to force them to to fight, so I'd swing at them. And and then I'm as soon as that happens, I'm into my flow and I'm reading that. So you, Bronos, you read the flow too when you when you're going fast. You may think more about setting up something than I do, but not a whole lot, I would imagine. Yeah, I think I think we're in the same, you know, I, I think the I think a lot of people are still thinking in those spots. Yep. The, the question is, how how are they cataloging, cataloging them? And if they're actually seeing those weaknesses and then, you know, like you, I hear this all the time. It's like, oh, I should have hit that. Well, realistically, you just saw it. There's no way that you're going to necessarily hit it until you come back to it. And then the question is, how long before you come back to it? Or do we apply more testing to it to make sure that it's not fake? They're not drawing you into something. Uh, you put more pressure on it. Uh, all of those pieces uh, to to kind of build that fight. Um, you know, and there is a ton of flow. Um, you know, the, in in those flows. To, and I still use. Uh, you know, we I talked a lot about that this constant distance when I first was talking about you know, the, the flowing it with your center and things like that. And then when I went to one, you we were at a class together and you were talking force between two people. Um, and then I started using that, you know, uh, 
the, the same way you, you were explaining it, because I thought it was better than, you know, the, how I was explaining it at the time. And then it's really gone from that to, you know, there is no difference between uh, the dance, really dancing. That, yeah. and, and, and what I call that now is connection with your opponent. That connection can be belly to belly. That connection can be at the sword's edge out of range. Yeah. And you still have that connection. And then you build that connection and that flow out of that. Yeah, I've actually come up in, in later years, came up with a, tech, a technique I call parallel circles. And it's a range movement technique. You, the inner circle, they're parallel circles. One is, they're both around the opponent. The one is at their range. And the next one is out about a foot outside of that. And what you do is you choose what, where, how, how you're going to initiate the, the thing. Are you going to step in to where you can hit them in the inner circle? Or are you going to step in to your, the outer circle when you can hit, hit them while you're still out of range, hit, hit their shields, cause them to swing, bounce off their sword, something like this. And you can do a, a combination where like the first four or five, six blows are all from that outer circle. and then. And when, when, when the pattern guides you to it, you step in with the blow instead of um, staying out. I saw a beautiful uh, exhibition instance of this. Uh, it was at uh, Sport of Kings and there was the finals and uh, God, I, I'm horrible on names and after the drugs, I really have trouble. But one of the Ontarian Knights, he's got his opponent on his knees and he is standing on the outer circle. So he has to go in, but he's right next to it. You know, he's not a foot away, he's six inches away or four inches away. And what he finally does is he throws a blow that's going down to the ribs and right at the end of the blow, he bends his front knee. And the front knee gave him that extra four inches of distance. And that was the only time he's ever in range. I thought it was just gorgeous. Yeah, and I think, you know, uh, and Thorfinn, you were kind of, you were kind of answer asking this question, and that was about that hip involvement. Um, what we have found, sometimes we talk so much hip that, that we get this circular hip involvement, and it, we create a cylinder. In other words, the hip will push forward while the reverse hip. So you take all the power. A lot of times we, we're like, we're teaching smaller people or women fighters how to use their hips. And then, but what we're not, what's not happening is we're not, also transferring that balance so that everything's driving forward. So what we create is this rotational exercise that's actually not creating any power at all because you got negative yeah. power going back and positive power going forward. Especially when people don't think to really tighten up their abs because ah. then, then you'll have the hip goes here and you haven't given any power to the upper body. Yeah, and in fact, what we found is, uh, especially if you're, if we've a number of people that were like belly dancers, they know how to isolate those things. So they're literally isolating their hips. Yeah, yeah. And nothing is happening. And nothing is happening. The, the, the hip movement actually serves to move the body in a certain way, move, move the weight somewhere, and you can use the weight to make, to make the sword guard. It's like, it's like standing on a, on a pier by the ocean and you tie a rope around your ankle and the other is, a, is a, an anchor and you toss it off. When you get to the end of that rope, there's your swing. Yeah, and likewise, I, I use my hip uh, a little bit differently because I don't use my hips for power. Uh, I use my hips to generate motion. So I use that hip rotation to connect through the through the core and up through the shoulder. And I use that to, to get the stick moving. And then once the stick's moving, then I'm I'm using the physics involved in the two pound object traveling at a certain at a certain speed. Um, but but you know, part of that is because you know, when I started fighting, I was small enough that like I couldn't just throw more body at my shots, right? So I can't, I can't just be, be stronger. I can't put more weight into it. So I had to use the physics of the stick. And, and, you know, Paul, when we, when I've talked to you about stick mechanics and the physics involved in the stick, um, really connected with me as far as like how, how I've been doing it all this time. Um, so yeah, I, I don't use my hips for power. I just use it to get the stick moving, use it to generate motion. And then from there, once it's it's moving, an object in motion tends to stay in motion, and um, you know it's it's and then it's placement and speed from there. 
Okay. Yeah, it's sort of interesting because um, my, you know, I take steps this way and that just to put me in a place I want to be. But uh, if you watch me fight, it looks really strange. It looks like I'm not doing anything and everything I'm doing is throwing arms. Um, my, my ex squire, Sir Brand uh, McClellan, he's watching me. And I, I haven't been fighting for the last five years because I had a medical problem. So I, I missed the, the last half of the 90s. So I'm in a, in a tournament and he is seeing me really fight for the, the first time. And uh, he's standing right next to somebody with a camera, which has sound on it too. And he's saying, look at that. He just reaches out his arms and things blow up, you know, because that's what it looks like. You don't see the big swings and stuff. You just, it just goes out. Well, and that's that's one of those things I've noticed about uh, the mechanics that Bronos uses uh, over the years is, you know, it, it looks like he's, you know, just got his hand in position and just, you know, deadly fast and, and powerful blows. And what you don't see is all the micro rotations that are happening from the ground up from from the from the toe through through the ankle, through the knee, through the hip. And, you know, there's all these little micro rotations that are happening that all that that all you know, result in that, that power chain and it looks fast and it looks like it's a really short stroke. Um, but it's got plenty of power and it's got plenty of, uh, you know, and, and there's, there's just, there's a lot more going on than what you can see because everything is happening so fast in those micro rotations. Yeah. Like when I throw a snap, um, when my hand gets to here, the snap is thrown. The rest yeah. of it's just ballistic motion. Yeah. So I'm curious, you have referenced that in the last second half of the 90s, you missed it because of injuries. So one of the things that we've been talking about here is the mental preparation or how you, how to get back into it. So here you are, you've had some injuries perhaps, and you've been out. Uh, mentally, how did you find yourself coming back to it? What did you do, if anything, to get back into fighting and back into fighting shape? Well, I'll, I'll answer your question, but how I got back in was actually to talk my chiropractors into letting me do this specific part of fighting and not that part. So, <laughs> um, my neck is had some problems way back when in judo. Somebody threw me on my head and drove the head into the the mat hard enough it almost knocked me out and now you i found out about it about it when i visited my brother-in-law back in illinois he's a chiropractor and he went through a whole routine with me including full body x-rays and i was watching him when he looked at the one in my neck and he literally turned white and he says you can't fight anymore <laughs> and told me why you know so i'm not stupid so i didn't fight for the next five years <laughs> Did you amend your armor in any way, like extra neck protection, or did it change your fighting style? And no, the only thing I had I had to do is I, I couldn't fight in mul multiple opponents. If I get hit from the front of the side from somebody in front of me, that's fine. If I take a spear to the side of my head, not so good. So I just, you know, well, can't fight, couldn't fight in wars, which I didn't like to fight in anyway by that time. <laughs> Well, that answers my question because I was curious which you which would you prefer the tournaments or the the many on minis for melee's wars or the, the single combats. Well, so put a line out of out of the mash the movie the series. Somebody's asking Hawkeye, you know, the, the exactness and the techniques, you know, and the high level stuff, and he says, "No, man, this is meatball surgery. We just want to put them together so we can send them back to." Well, that's my distinction between tourney fighting and war fighting. It's a whole different game. So I got to tell you, I got lucky enough to uh, fight Paul in a crown uh, during that time period. And uh, it was an amazing uh, tournament. Thank you, uh, Paul, for that experience. But one of the things that happened that day was you were fighting two stick uh, for quite a day. And then at the finals, you switched against me to a uh, great sword. And what this brings to mind for me is over all the years of your training and you're applying all of your, uh, <clears throat> your, your style to different weapon forms, of those, what was your favorite weapon form to use? Um, and is there a reason why that that was like your favorite weapon form? Say for instance, Naginata, Greatsword, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I developed um, four, I, I fight more weapons than I, in my early days than I fought in my later days. Like axes and maces are not 
real good turning weapons because you give to way too much distance. Um, great axes are really sort of clumsy. I've only seen one person I thought was really doing a good job. Um, so I developed uh, four weapon systems to where I figured crown finals level. So your sword and shield, two sword, glaive, and uh, great sword. Great sword was the last one. And I, I only fought three crowns with it. I, did, I got quarters, quarters, semis. All six losses were to left-handers. And then I figured out this minute change I had to make. And my fiance didn't want to be queen. So I didn't fight crowns for 15 years. So, but anyway, um, to your question, my favorite is great sword. Interesting. Yeah, I got to tell you, uh, your power generation with that great sword is terrifying. Um, second fight, I had fully blocked that shot, and you hit it so hard, my shield, that it blew through my shield and hit me hard enough to kill me. And you were like, "No, no, I hit your shield." I'm like, "No, I'm I'm dead." <laughs> right? Was, but I mean, that that form that you have, that uh, that power generation you have, is is just devastating. And, and uh, yeah. you know, it, you, you're definitely one of the the champions of that that style. I gotta tell you, it's really it was really great. Thank you. And my power generation is very, very different because you'll see most great sword people, they, they, they do this, you know, like that. I don't. Um, I use it like a whip. I pull this arm out till it's straight and then the whole body turns with it. So your arm is straight and you're rotating fast. And this one gives a little push at the end, not much. And it hits like a ton of bricks. I mean, God, it's just horrendous how hard I can do that thing. One of our episodes was uh, serving in crown. And I'm wondering, certainly if I'm going to ask somebody about being king, you would be a good person to speak to. So I'm kind of curious, what is it that you enjoyed uh, about being king, about being royalty? Um, making people happy and arranging things so they would be, where things would work better and they'd be happy. Um, otherwise, I would have been quite happy if you didn't get to be king when you when you won the tournament. After, after a while in the West, we, we had this uh, Queen's uh, Champion Tournament. And it was done on the, the, the Sundays of coronation. And it was up to the Queen. You could either be fighting and the winner would be her champion or the winner would get the Queen's favor and she would choose her champion. That's usually what they did. And that was really fun for a while because we had, we had everybody, all the really good fighters are doing this. And you didn't have to be king. <laughs> well, and they, the Capote pretty much serves that function in the West right now as well. Um, you know, and that's that's one that I, I definitely want to get to. Um, that's, that's my bucket list. Uh, I want to get out to one of those. Uh, but, you know, having that, uh, you know, I mean, you know, Thorfinn was there at the beginning of that. Um, but, you know, having having that opportunity to, to be able to fight at that level without having a job to do, um, there's definitely something to be said for that. Yeah, the, I sure. love the Capode. Um, I, I would imagine the quality of the, of the, in general, fights in a particular tournament varies widely by who shows up. Um, but that's a good deal, you know, because the, the lower fighters get, get some feeling for the upper fighters and so on and so forth. And it's a wonderful tradition. Um, these Queen's Champion things are basically the round before the quarter, the uh, semi quarterfinals and up, that's, those are the people who are entering. So it was right from your first fight on, you were running into the really good guys. Well, and at the same time, one of the things we talk about is, you know, as far as fighting crown tournament and preparing for it and, and competing at that level, like there is no simulation for crown tourney. Um, everybody is, is, is fighting their best. And, you know, I've often said that crown tourney is not necessarily the best evaluation that we have um, because you're not necessarily fighting the best fighters in your kingdom because they may or may not be wanting to, to do the job at that time. Right. But every, it's just the most consistent evaluation we have because everybody that is fighting in that list is fighting to the same caliber. Like everybody's trying to do their best, um, to, to, to get that job. Um, and it's, and, and it happens every three or six months, um, or four months or whatever it is for you guys. Yeah. Four or six months. Um, and it happens regularly 
and the the level of competition, regardless of uh, regardless of you know the quality of the the overall quality of the the fighters in the in the list, the intent of everybody in that list is exactly the same every time you go. So crown is one of those those opportunities that you know we, we often hear people say, well, I want you to give me a crown caliber fight. I want you to fight me like you're fighting in crown. Yeah, I have a hard time doing that because. You, you can't simulate that environment. It's just, there, there's, there's not the same. And, and unless the, unless you're, you're fighting where the stakes are real, um, it, it's just really hard to, to, to step up to that. See, I, that doesn't work for me. I can, I can fight my best fight for nothing. I don't need it. I don't need a prize. Um, actually one, I think one of my favorite set of fights is, um, uh, Count, Count Rorick of Calentier. Yeah. This, yeah. this is somebody that I think is big and fast and strong and scary. Um, and his squire is about my size. And of course, he's a lot bigger than us. And he he brought me back to uh, at, at Lily's. We were not to fight in the war, but to train him and his students. And we're we're at the the, the site, and he and I and his squire. We were doing just us round robins, and there was no calibration. Just swing as hard as you want, and that was so cool. <laughs> you know, you get a tip across your helmet, you smell the ozone. You know, <laughs> yep. and and uh, we didn't know, but after right when we stopped, there's a there's a whole circle of people around us, <laughs> about you know thirty feet away. And he said uh, that the Knights grabbed him right afterwards and said, you can do that with Bellatrix. Don't pull that shit on us. Yeah, yeah I've had those moments at, a, at Australia. Um, you know, I've been fighting uh, Duke Guy at Australia, you know, for, for, you know, almost 30 years. And every chance I get to, you know, to, to fight with, with him, I'm going to. And there was one Australia where, where he and I finally got a break to, to fight each other. And there was this thing in the air you know, it's like Sean's fighting guy, guys fighting Sean, and you know they're going to be at the flagpole at three o'clock, and and the, you know there's this buzz that's happening around it, and and you know at the same time it's like I just want to fight with one of my favorite fighters ever, but I also understand that like people need to see their heroes, yeah, like, that's part of your job. Like that. Yeah, they need to be able to see that. You know, even just in in pickups at Estrella, and and you know that's one of the reasons I love the heroic, heroic champions at at Pensac as well. Yeah, me you too. Know, we, you, you need to see your heroes fight other heroes uh and and where when we're in a fight like that you know i don't really care you know i don't care that 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 guy you know okay so duke guy of castle kirk uh you know hit me pretty solid yeah well he should you know because he's a legendary figure you know um but being able to, to put on that show and being able to, to to show people the excellence of our sport um, I think is important for for people to see, even though to some extent it'd be kind of nice if we could just kind of have that for our, for ourselves to be able to just enjoy that for ourselves. Yeah, but, you know, providing us not a spectacle but an insp inspiring moment, or right. you got to be a hero. You know, that's what the whole game is. That's what a lot of people play that for. They want to see these great fighters. Um, so yeah, you got to do that. It's your job. Yep, absolutely. Fair enough. When uh, Sean invited me to participate, I went, me? Talk to Duke Ball? Oh, my God. <laughs> and he laughed at me. But when I joined, you know, the Bellatrix snap, everybody's like, oh, the Bellatrix snap, the Bellatrix snap. So uh, I, I understand uh, the importance of, of being out and being seen. Uh, and I'm enjoying this very much myself. Oh, I am, too. Uh, speaking about the, the Bellatrix snap, my first fighting manual was like a 15 page mimeographed, typed out the, the, the illustrations. There were like six illustrations and they were actually life drawings. One of my friends, I, I modeled them and she drew them. And being very naive in the ways of publishing, um, I wasted one of the illustrations on a technique which I very thoroughly described right underneath it this is only useful in this one particular situation, not anything else. Well, people saw the picture and they didn't read underneath it. And so that thing became the snap of the whole Eastern side of the country. 
and it's nothing like the setup, not even close. Well, and, I, and what it's what it's what it's led to is that, like I was right after the pandemic started, I was having a conversation with this this night somewhere in the, in the southeast. And I'm talking about changing blows. And he says, yeah, I just come out like this and go like that. And I'm going, ah. <laughs> hey, Paul, uh, fun question. Do you still have a copy of that? Um, maybe. <laughs> oh, man, I would, love to, I would love to get a photocopy of it to put on my bookshelf. That'd be so rad. <laughs> oh, and, and also, so we can, you know, get the uh, get that Bellatrix snap, you know, repopulate that a little bit, get get people believing in that again, right? For real. Look, I I hate to admit this, but I I grew up. This was the Bellatrix snap. I think I very likely still refer to it to this day when I'm teaching people. I'm like, well, Duke Paul invented this. I'm curious though. So you started off with, you know, your snap has it evolved in any way have you seen any changes to it anything that you wish hadn't changed to it well yeah it's changed over the years like i said the first one was a sort of a sidearm swing with a lot of body motion and now i, I use that basically I'm, I'm going on biomechanics and physics so you don't need to come out there you know you only you only need your your body to be connected you, your abs have to connect your lower body to your upper body your shoulder has to be tight and that connects the arm to the body. And this is one of the things that, that was mistaken. Um, I hold on with the bottom two fingers on my sword, not the top ones. Because um, there's a theory of what, looking at the body called anatomy chains, trains, and they identified um, lines of muscles and connective tissue that run all over the body. And um, from these, the, these two fingers, a line runs up the arm and under the arm and then spreads out across the back. And the big lines that are coming up from the bottom go right through that area and that makes them, it turns them all on. Whereas the front two fingers, the line comes up the arm and goes out over the chest. You don't use the chest much in this. Could you show like you right now you said it used to be that you would do a bigger motion just for one more time would you show me as you sit there uh do, are you coming straight out from the shoulder like a boxing stretch? i didn't think this is going to be a demo but I've got a ruler and i can stand up <laughs> well while, while paul's getting that one of the things that he's talking about is is as your hand if your hand gets as your hand goes further away from your body you're putting more stress on your elbow it's arm and moment um the, the the object becomes heavier on the other end as as your as your hand gets further away from your body and it, it actually puts quite a bit of strain on your on your shoulder doing that so so um can you see this thing mm -hmm. i actually have a sword right over there if you need me to do it let me get that Oops, I'm having trouble with my balance too. And one of the other nice things about the operation. So I'll swing, my blade's dropping and I'm turning, and the sword comes out like that. Yeah. Yeah, and you can see how the tip goes out, but his hand is still within within that core, right within the quarters of the shoulder. So yeah, that's so from it. this side, you, you'll see yep. it straight out. So you're driving that direct line. And it, it, that direct line is also the fastest path through your opponent. Um, I actually aim for, um, I use it like a whip. I don't yeah. use it like, like a sword. And so when I'm, when I'm targeting somebody with a snap, I'm aiming for the, the power to come in about two inches or an inch or two inches past the, the thing. Because if you, if you push through, you uh, elongate the time of contact, the time of power transfer. And the longer that time, the less strong the power is. So I want to come in like a whip and go pop and come away like that. Huh. So it's all transferred right then. Yep. And I can actually, I can actually take, a, take a, a sword, full speed snap and, and throw it like that, and it will stop pointing that way. Yeah, and that's, that's what gives us the, the punch instead of the push. 
and it's it's the, well, it's more the, of a the, pop, <laughs> right? Yeah. But that pop, like, yeah, it's it's the pop. No, it's, a, punch, yeah, it's a punch as opposed to yeah, as opposed to a push because if you make contact and then you push further through on a follow through, people don't actually feel that. They feel that punch. They feel that concussive uh, punch on uh, at, at impact. Yeah, and, and I yeah. think you're, you're 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 so you're also doing a thing where you close your hand at the point of impact. Nope. Okay. I hold on with these fingers. Remember. Right. So you, the bottom okay. two. Think about think about using a hammer. You don't do a hammer like this. Right. Right. You do it like this, and that's the same thing I'm doing. Yeah, that's something I try to explain to people too. It's it's it's. It's that same place. Um, the hand is relatively loose, and I my my snap at the end, those back two fingers, yeah. essentially transfer that force. Yeah, yeah. I actually use a lanyard that comes around the comes around from the front of the sword around my wrist back, so it holds it in, but it's below above the wrist, so you don't get any wrist movement or applying power. It's all just from the arm. Well, mostly. Not that good. Hey, Paul, do you use that uh, when you when you make that uh, pop that you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, do you use that recoil to to load into a next shot, or would you say that you would? Uh, uh, it, that's not how you how you power load to the next move. Well, that's sort of how I thought of it for a long time, but um, I, I sort of don't do it anymore. You know, if it happens, it happens. That's great. So what I do is I develop the things out there like that, and what I will do is I'll start the backward movement of the sword by translating my body back an inch, like I'm headbutting somebody. And so I'm pulling with my whole body right down the, the sword, and then it goes out and we play around with that out there. So you're returning with your big back muscles then? Yep. Yeah, it's interesting. That's a, that's a cool power load technique right there. That's probably that, so I've got, the snap, yeah, yes, yes, you need that for forehand blows. But this thing here, I call the single hip, and it's ungodly effective. And then, of course, the teardrop, and then the offside teardrop. <laughs> That's one of the nasty little combinations using this sliding into almost range and doing a commitment swing. So I can come in like this, sliding in. Um, and I'm gonna miss, I'm not quite there. So I'm gonna miss. And I'm gonna come down here and go into an offside teardrop. Um, and it's really, really fast. <laughs> Basically by the, time, by the time you've realized it didn't hit you, it's hit you. Question for you, is it fast do you think because of uh, speed or is it because of uh, it's a timing trick? Physics. It, it, if physics, it's the speed, uh, I got you. Yeah, see, you're swinging something, and, and every time you, you shorten the radius, it has to speed up. Okay, so you've got right. a snap, which is doing exactly that coming around the body. And then you come back into a teardrop, which does it again. So you're just multiplying it every time you turn. Right on. The one, one little funny thing is that when you get that, when you're like this one, which I'll come out with to hit people, you can also pull that through. And by the time it's turning around down here, you actually can't have your arm in close. You have to have it out of here because it's so damn fast, you won't be able to control it. So I'm curious, sorry, I, I curious monkey today. Primarily here on Coach's Corner, we of course focus on fighting, but you've been in the SCA for a really long time. You've done a lot of things. What is the thing that you are most proud of or that you that you're most pleased about that you have done within the within the society? I'm I'm really very proud of my developing the system of, of uh, fighting I use. Um, and I was really overjoyed that somebody made it possible for me to publish the book and then the next two books coming out eventually, I hope. <laughs> so not to uh, steal the glory, can you, uh, I'm not gonna ask for both books, but um, what's, the, what's the premise on the next book? The next is training. Um, 
so how you run a fighting practice, how you how you progress in training, uh, and like what weapon should you start teaching first, and then what's the second technique you should teach? Well, this is not a weapons technique; it's a movement technique, you know. And then on and on like that, and then uh, how do you tell that you're actually progressing if you don't have anybody there to tell you? So I I give you some some. If you if you can do this, if you can do this, if you can do this, then you then you're doing it pretty much right. Um, that's going to be a real hard hard section to write. Uh, actually, when I started, I, I with talking with uh, uh, Mr. Smara and then her editors, and um, I came up with a, an outline for this thing, and they assisted in the things that they would like to see, and uh, and it's just a it's a really big complex things, and I said. I think I'll start on a little piece that I, I know pretty well. So I said, um, I'll, I'll do uh, training exercises, you know, cause I know them pretty well. And I said, but I can only think about three or four. And then I started writing them down. <laughs> so we're up to 29 now. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. Once you start digging in, it, it seems like it's like all the things start coming together and and you, and you develop and think about new ways. <clears throat> I do like uh, the, the part I really uh, looking forward to reading is the progression, because I, I think we, some people understand some progression um, training, but most of that progression training is physical progression training. And that's what it, where it should be in the beginning anyways. But then, you know, the, the part we often miss is the, the progression training into the mental exercises as well. Yeah, I've got a bunch of them for the mental exercises. I have this, this dog, two dodging exercises, which I think are really important. Um, both in the first one, you're standing, they're standing, your person being trained is standing in front of you. You're about a half step away from in range and you're holding a sword up here like this with two hands and you you start, you slide forward and start swinging very slowly. And they have to just come out of the, dodge out of the way just barely. And then you make a big swing and then you come back again, another, and they dodge out of it just barely. I think I saw that in the matrix. Yeah, it's, it's actually up on the, on the, 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 the website that has the, the videos that the book refers to that's it, on there. And then the other one, you eat, you have two people training. They each have a, a sword, no shield, and they alternate swings. You know, I'm swinging here now as I'm, and you can't block, you have to dodge. So I swing and as my sword goes past, then I have to do a return by and, and dodging the blade coming at me. That is a really fun exercise. It's really pretty to watch once you get some people to know it. Uh, and, and that's that's a big part. Uh, two things happen there is one, you're starting to learn how to read somebody well. And you're starting to learn to, to read not only their movement, but how, how movement works in general. Yes. Yeah. And by practicing, you know, we get into boxing and stuff like that. Dodges is a ton of work on dodging and slipping and rolling and all of these pieces to, to essentially change the flow get out of the way of the blow scenario so that you don't have to worry as much about it. In our sport, it's even more important because one blow could be the end. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think we don't cover enough of those skills, not only just the, the act of physically dodging, but also the recognition of, of that time somebody is, you know, understanding how fast and that time that that person's working in so that you can dodge in the correct time. Yeah. Um, because that's a, that's an evaluation that has to happen in a fight. I use a lot of, uh, a lot of visualization when I'm teaching that kind of stuff. Like this one here, you imagine a bright line of light coming out of your sword and you imagine that you can feel it pushing the air towards you. Um, it, there's been a been a few times, a couple times in crown finals where literally the sword, the their sword was pushing me out of the way, and their targets they have left open were pulling my blades in. It was sort of a transcendental experience. Hey Paul, we uh, I've been saying over the uh, 
over the, the these pandemic years now um that, that i don't i don't know that there's ever been a better time to learn our sport from the ground up um because we can't do just sparring uh there's so much groundwork that we can do with both pell work and footwork and a lot of this the the training stuff that you're talking about and one of the things that i that, that we've seen over the years you know getting people started you know people don't want to do that work nope they they, they want to just they see the fighting which is the most dynamic thing that we have it's the hook that, that gets people into the sca and you know and then they realize that there are many other things that 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 make this you know worthwhile to be part of um but they just want to put on armor and 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 just go at it and start swinging and 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 you know throughout the pandemic it's it's i think it's become much more obvious to me that you know, if if we could get people to to find the patients to to you know, it's like give me six months um, of of training before we actually put the armor on you. Um, I just think that that what can be learned in that time before you actually start fighting, you know, because because there's there's a lot of the physical stuff that we that that we have to teach our body how to do, but when you put somebody against somebody that is trying to do them bodily harm. And swinging a stick at them um all of all of the, the like there's this disconnect between the training and the combat involved with like fear for your life for lack of a better term i mean um so what are some of the things that that you've seen over the years that, that we can do to kind of mitigate that and and to, to find that balance between doing the training and and actually letting people you know get the you know, the, the, the cookie of, you know, actually doing the thing. Um, in the old days, we used to break it down. Um, we do, we'd start out with slow work and then we would, during that, we would identify certain techniques that we wanted to talk about, stop and really go over the techniques. And, um, you know, this is how you throw it. Here are some options. Um, here's the defense. Here's how you can avoid the defense and on and on and on like that, really just take it apart and put it back together. And if anybody came up with something new, because this is real early on in society, the whole practice would stop and we'd come in and discuss what the hell happened there. You know, and what can we do? How can we avoid it? How can we make it better? And stuff like that. Um, and then we'd, we'd get into, it was um, controlled fighting. So basically, you, you would basically slow work fast. You had to keep up the motions. You couldn't just stop there and, and pop like that. And then we went on to fast. And in those days, it was considered a, a good thing to really learn the different weapons. So between coronations and crowns, we don't, we, you could fight with your best weapon. And between crowns and cor coronations, you couldn't fight with your best weapon. So everybody learned all sorts of weapons. That's sort of gone by the board. <laughs> so uh, we, we had a question that popped up in the uh, in the live stream here um, from uh, His Grace Torgal up in Ontir. He says, uh, could Paul comment on the Ontarian high guard and its defeat of the Western style at 20 year? Um. I can't really comment because I don't remember 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> I know, no. I know, I know Torgal was down there 20 year, um, just cleaning house uh, down there. And it was interesting, uh, you know, I, I, I watched uh, Christopher of Houghton uh, win Aiden Bell crown in the spring of 1983. And I see Chris is watching as well. Um, and, and it was the, it was that high guard, right. Which was, you know, what we, what we affectionately refer to now as the iron chicken um and at the time it was it was kind of unstoppable i mean it was a whole new thing and and it was you know uh, torgal was using it up on ontario about the same time that, that chris was using it uh in in the west and in an aiden belt and i know for me uh having having watched that crown um you know we you know we tend to trend towards the things that are successful in a, in a given period and so there was a period of time that we we were all fighting with the iron chicken you know doing 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 the high guard um and you know that 
having fought that for a while, um, my, the way that I throw the offside leg in the Molin A directly comes from that, even though I'd never seen Chris throw an offside leg from that high guard. Um, my, the way that I throw all of my off body stuff directly comes from, from that line. So you, you were around when that whole high guard thing, you know, was, was created. Um, what, what do you see as the evolution of that? And how do you, how do you see how, like, how did that happen? Like, did it happen just coincidentally in Ontario and in the West, or was there enough crossover that, that, that they were related? Well, there's always people that will look, they look at the, at the fighters that are doing the best and whatever the hell they're doing, they will adopt it. Right. You, you can see this in the evolution of shields, you know, so um, I, I started out fighting with a sort of a round shield. It's slightly bigger, but it's a small one, like 22 by 20, 26 or something like that. And people tried that and they, and they realized this is not an easy shield to use. I use it because it's a good training shield. And since I didn't, I was successful with it, I just kept it. Um, and then Radnor came along and he had the bunny round and then it changed into the square. They're all the same shield, they're just different shapes. So, um, and the same thing will go on with fighting. Torgal was a gift, gifted fighter. People going, you know, I, um, so their people are going to imitate Whoever's being on the top top right then. Um, the Ontarian style has some interesting things to it. And uh, but it's uh, it, it's it becomes a matter of taste, uh, more or less. I'm an offensive fighter, that's a defensive style. And I I am really, really a bear on using optimal biomechanical techniques optimal ones use of physics that doesn't um i'm i like techniques that that save you every fraction of a second so you can use it somewhere else theirs doesn't that doesn't so it's, it's my preference to go with the the flowy style that i use which really starts working after the first blow it doesn't really do you much good after the first blow once you get into all the the weird stuff that I can do on the returns and, and the commitments, things like that, then it becomes hell on wheels. But um, basically, they, I can't get really too far into it, you know, because the you know, basically if somebody swings at you, they have gotten into range just barely and they maneuver positions when they see something that they think you've gotten out of position, they go for it. And uh, that's about as far as I can really get into. I'm not a master of that style. So, well, yeah. yeah, I was just kind of curious about, you know, having witnessed the the development of those things, um, you know, kind of happening in the West and on and, and on tier kind of independently. It was just just kind of looking at it from a evolutionary st standpoint, I guess. I actually can't remember when I first saw it, so I can't really comment. I know I know Torgal was one of the first and he's an, he's a talented fighter. Another interesting thing about that, when you reach a certain level of expertise, it doesn't matter what style you use. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I would I would tend to agree there. I, I think a lot of us look and and uh, we're you know we're like just do it this way, but you know for a, a young fighter that that doesn't work that way because of we have all that background and you can pretty yeah. much change into anything and still be dangerous because. Right. Your control, mental control, and control of range and tempo is is something that's that that comes along with any style that you set up. In. So, you know, uh, Thorfinn had a question, I think. Had a question and comment and stuff like that. Um, I want to first off say that I love that how all of the kind of West Coast fighting styles have all learned from each other and morphed over time. And a yeah. lot of what I do is definitely you know, based on the Bellatrix style. And then of course, I learned a lot from Montier and even uh, would come down from Torval. But to answer Torval's question about the Western thing, I was gonna say, but how did it turn out at Eagles afterwards? What? <laughs> so anyway, I just wanted to poke yeah, up. I'm not gonna get into one of those. <laughs> <laughs> we, we had Rednor on a few weeks back uh, talking talking about a little bit about that too, so. So, 
All right. Well, we're looking at uh, 855. It's been a great conversation. I, I tell you, it, it, this is a, it, it's been a fun one because we usually have some questions. The standard questions will pop in there. I, I think we started with one and then we just went off. And then, and then Bess had a great time. She, she had that little inquisitive monkey mind going. So I, am, uh, I love that, coined that term for her. And, uh, and, and between Bess and Thorpe, I was just like, I have nothing to do. These guys are asking all the cool questions. I'm just going to listen. <laughs> yeah, I really appreciated the questions because that's I, I really makes it makes a better thing for me. It's a, I'm responding and then I can build off things like that. So thank you both. Hey, Paul, can I get a I'm going to order a copy of that book, but can I get it signed? Yeah, sure. Right. Um, what I've been doing is, you know what a book plate is? I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a little piece of paper about like this that has the E on the back. And yep. I, I can sign that out and send it to you. And you, got you, know, it. They, you just put it in the book. Coolio, thanks, buddy. I, I can look forward to getting it. I'll order it uh, tonight. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Awesome. Ben, oh, do you wait. have anything more? Just one thing. Uh, anybody that's, that's bought my book, um, if you if you get a hold of me, I will, or I'll look on the Bellatrix Fighting School page. I will attach a document that is a very detailed outline of the book. It shows you all the chapters, sub chapters, uh, sections in the chapters, um, where the where the videos go, and so forth. So it's really nice if you're going to study the book. Just reading right through it is not necessarily the best way. But if you want to look at something particular, this will tell you where it is very easily. Awesome. So, Bess, did you uh, do you have anything else? I, I honestly think that I'm okay for now. All Just right. Tonight, I'm going to wake up and go, but wait. <laughs> but for now, I'm okay. Well, one thing I learned is anytime you want to reach out to Paul, I, he's, he's a listener. And he loves, oh, absolutely. He loves talking, fighting, and training, and um you know we've we've had lots of talk about it and it's amazing i tell you yeah just so. anybody get in touch with me and we'll talk yep. so. especially you man <laughs> <laughs> um sean uh what do we got next week oh uh, that's a good question i usually look that up hang on hang on just uh, like, i think um, I, I have the page up i think you have it i up? should yeah. i should actually ask uh thorpin what we have next week because i think he's running that one and, uh, I, you know, and I think Paul will appreciate this one. And it is Elephant in the Room, Crown Calibration, or High-End Tournament Calibration. So I think we're going to put a talk together because we hear that coined quite often. And, and, I, I, and I have a lot of, you know, this, a lot of people at practice is like, why does there have to be a different calibration in crown than in a normal fight and in, in anything different? Or I hit somebody yeah. in crown and, or I hit somebody at practice and say, you know, uh, that's good. But if it was crown, it probably wouldn't be. I have for sure heard that exact phrase. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I think we're going to have a discussion and hopefully a lively discussion on that. I bet you will. <laughs> <laughs> next week so uh we look forward to everybody uh coming out and checking that show out and i wanted to thank everybody here uh for uh, uh for coming out uh and uh listening to our conversation with paul i was uh i i there is not a, a point that i don't learn and, and appreciate paul more and more when i talk to him because uh thank you it's the way we explain things oftentimes comes in two different ways, but the, the sub pieces inside yep. that are so close. Yep. So, Sean, anything you got? No, I just want to say thanks again to Paul for, for joining us. It's, it's like, likewise, it's always a pleasure. Um, and, you know, we're always saying that, that the more you get exposed to the differences, the more you understand the commonalities. And that's kind of what Bronis was just talking about is like, like, we all have different ways of, of expressing it. Um, but, but ultimately it all gets back to the same core concepts and, um, you've been teaching those core concepts, um, longer than just about anybody. So yeah. my, my thanks to you for your contributions over the years and, uh, and for, for joining us tonight to, to keep that going. Yeah. You know, my, the 50th anniversary of my nighting was about a month ago. Yeah. yeah. I was like, when you said seventies, I was like, Whoa, this is awesome. So just a quick one before we kind of sign off. How long did it take you to get knighted? Um, well, I, I didn't, I, 
for his October tournament of 70, I got knighted in June of uh, 71. Yeah, okay. Awesome. And I won, I won October of 71. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like a slacker. Oh, I know, right? it's, it's different. It really is. You know, you <laughs> really is. <laughs> so, That's awesome. <laughs> wait, when did you get, Paul, when did you get knighted? April? Uh, uh, June crown of 71. Yeah, that was one month before I was born. <laughs> but see, at least I was still alive. <laughs> yeah, I, love that. I, I was, love that I was, uh, I was alive. I was uh, three months old. Oh my god! <laughs> oh, no, I, no, I, yeah, yeah, me and Thor from the same age. So yeah, yeah ask I was, me the story uh, of my of my nighting. It's an interesting one. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Really well, we'll uh, we'll let you go, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. I look forward to our next episode together. Me too. Thanks uh, again for asking me. I really appreciate it. No, no, I, I like I said, it's, uh, it's. Uh, I think our next one should be great, and uh, I'll get a hold of you soon, and we'll come up with something. And uh, thanks everybody again for uh, coming out for Coach's Corner. Uh, tell your friends. Remember, you can go back to our uh, SCA Coach's Corner. There's lots of there's a, a database uh, that holds lots of video in there, uh, or at least points to lots of great training videos out there, and uh, and lots of great people on our site that uh, have been helping and guiding people for a while now. It's been amazing to watch. So uh, look forward to seeing everybody soon and uh, have a good night. Bye all.